file is a legacy of civil war in Latin America. As you may know, this is part of a year-long series where we're looking at post neoliberal Latin America in the current for democracy constitutions and citizenship. The next event will be on March 19, and we'll see on visual integration. So we'll have two scholars, Marcela um, Sadducci, who's a sociologist and demographer working on immigration uh, coming from Argentina, and Isabella Canis, who is at the University of Maryland, who will come uh, to talk about uh, epistemic uh, communities, particularly in the, in the energy sectors and integration um, uh, through those communities. Um, then on May 8th, which is a Friday, we'll have the end of the year conference. It's going to be a fabulous event with uh, people coming from all corners of, uh, of the continent. So I encourage everyone to attend. All the information is in the DCC website. Today, we are very fortunate to have two fabulous speakers who will be introduced by our fabulous uh, Pet uh, moderator. So I'll just make the, the, the first step introduction, which is to introduce Deborah Thomas. She's a professor in the Department of Anthropology and African Studies here. <coughs> she works on the race and, and ethnicity issues uh, in the Caribbean, especially in Jamaica. And without further ado, I'll, I'll let you introduce our speakers. Thank you. Um, Great afternoon to be here with our two speakers who submitted and some really, really uh, interesting papers. So I'm looking forward to the discussion afterwards as well. Um, I want to briefly introduce them. Uh, Deborah Yashar is a professor of politics and international affairs at Princeton University, where she also co directs the Project on Democracy and Development and directs the program in Latin American Studies. Her research focuses on the intersection of democracy and citizenship, the origins and endurance of political regimes, the relationship between citizen regimes, local autonomy and ethnic politics, collective action and contentious politics, interest representation, party systems, and globalization. She's the author of two books. It all is really good. Uh, Demanding Democracy, Reform and Reaction in Costa Rica and Guatemala, and Contesting Citizenship in Latin America, The Rise of Indigenous Movements, and the post civil Challenge. And Contesting Citizenship received the 2006 Best Book Prize from the New England Council on Latin American Studies. Professor Yashar has also written several articles, published in leading journals and edited volumes, and is currently working on a new book tentatively entitled Latin Citizenship and Public Security in Post-Authoritarian Latin America. She's received numerous fellowships, including awards for Fulbright, the SSRC, the AC, uh, a ACLS, and the U.S. Institute of Peace, and she's currently editing the Journal of World Politics. Loti Silva is an associate professor of anthropology at City College of New York. Uh, she's a recipient of various fellowships and awards and has published her work widely uh, in, in journals in the U.S. and uh, in Latin America. Her overarching themes explore post-war processes in uh, one of El Salvador's former war zones and a region known for its peasant revolutionary participation. She documents what she terms the entangled aftermaths of war and displacement, aftermaths that have produced post-war deception, disillusionment, and an obligated migration. Her book, Everyday Revolutionaries, Gender, Violence, and Disillusionment in Post-War El Salvador, unmasks how community members are asked contradictorily and in different contexts to relinquish their identities as revolutionaries and to develop a new sense of themselves as productive yet marginal post-war citizens by the same rubric of participation that fueled their revolutionary action. Everyday Revolutionaries received the 2013 International Latina Book Award in the Best First Book Nonfiction category. And Professor Silver is currently working on two projects, one which follows Salvadorans who have migrated both to the US, uh, both to the US and in Spain, and interrogates their experiences of incorporation, exclusion, assimilation, and how these are different in these different locations. And the second project lies at the intersection of science studies, medical anthropology, and childhood studies in, uh, investigates childhood genetic difference, care, and access to citizenship rights. I should tell you that Loti is also an award-winning poet. Uh, so I believe we're going to begin with here, right? Okay. 
so much for this invitation. Um, there are so many people to thank, uh, particularly those who organized this uh, incredible series. Um, I also want to thank my co-panelists. I had the great pleasure of reading her work. I have to say I did not know she was a poet, <laughs> although midstream I, I received an email from a friend and I was telling her how beautifully written, oh not God. just insightful, but <laughs> these guys. So, um, I promise you mine is not poetic, I don't know. Uh, so I'd like to just start off by, by thanking you all for this, uh, for this incredible opportunity. I also want to start off um, with just a little bit of a story and a warning. The warning is, first of all, I never keep time correctly, so whichever of you would cut me off when, when the time permits, I'm inviting you. Yeah. Yeah. That would be great. Um, uh, and secondly, this room is uh, is a little bit surprising to me. I feel as though this is a, a wedding reception or something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I will not. I will not. All right. So stepping back for a moment, some of these introductory comments. I was really thinking about Albert Hirschman as I was uh, driving in to, uh, to give this uh, talk and as I was preparing my comments. Um, and just this up here. Because Churchman did so many things, but one of the things he oftentimes argues is the art of trespassing can oftentimes be a really productive, useful thing. And I really see this enterprise that's been organized this year as a bridge across disciplines and the like. Um, is really an example of not just speaking across disciplines, but I should say even the project that I'm presenting today draws on work that I did a few years ago at the Institute for Advanced Studies at Hebrew University, and so the publication from the show who comes from now. But the project as a whole that I'm presenting really starts from a misstep or a surprise visit that I took in the mid-1990s when I went to Central America originally to start a project on democratization in the aftermath of civil war. I really wanted to understand how democratization could take place in the context of armed combatants, in the context of violence, in a way that theories of democracy really had not at that point uh, considered. But what I was most struck by on that trip was not just that the project was interesting as it was written, but that it was not the primary concern of the people that I had the opportunity to talk to. What they most wanted to talk about was the violence that was happening in their everyday communities. Yes, they wanted to talk about the violence in the past and military abuses and human rights abuses and the disappeared and the like. It's not that that had gone away. But the most immediate conversation people wanted to talk about was which bus routes they could take, what had happened on the corner of the Colonia, this concern that even with the transition to democracy, violence was very present, a different kind of violence, maybe a more randomized in terms of how people understood violence, but a violence that people were living with in a very central way. So there's ongoing violence, but different kinds of violence, new fears of violence and the like. And that's what I really wanted to so I went into the prop field planning to do one thing. I returned with no intellectual apparatus to study something else because it struck me as the most central question. And here is just a, a nod to you know our conversations. This comes up in Wilson's paper about the children migrants to the United States is oftentimes now framed as a response to uh, this contemporary violence in play. So the paper that I'm sharing with you is less of an empirical paper for those of you who read it, more of a conceptual enterprise to try and push political science debates about democracy and citizenship beyond this more formalist understanding. And I won't read for all this, but the paper basically uh, uh, develops into four parts. Today, what I want to remind you of, because I understand you all had to read the paper uh, to come to this, but I'm assuming that many of you did not, let me, let me tell you, which is that oftentimes when you think about um, citizenship, um, there is the presumption that democracy at its core promotes citizenship. You move from authoritarian rule to democracy, you move from military regimes to electoral regimes, and citizenship in some format is supposed to come along with that dynamic. Now, in my earlier work, I had thought quite a bit about citizenship regimes in a different way, and I tried to unpack it by thinking about how citizenship is obviously not just about granting elections and laughing as I say this because those of you who are not political science couldn't be thinking, well, of course, but nonetheless, it is not just about granting political rights, but the very first thing, and Rogers, you've you know, written about a lot of this, is that it's about a sense of belonging. Who gets to be a citizen? Who is included in that sense of nationalism? So the first question is oftentimes about membership. The second is about rights, and here I'm drawing from T.H. Marshall. We can critique him for a whole bunch of things, but he was very 
important, getting us to think about these different kinds of rights that we associate with citizenship, civil, the right to speak out and to organize and the like, political, the right to vote and to be elected, and social, more complicated, but the right to a minimum standard of living. So this is about the who, this is about the what, and then the how, what are the ways in which people relate to the state? Do you relate as individuals, with Julia as an individual, she's a citizen, she relates to the state, or do you relate to the state as a group who are members of the UPenn community and so you interact um, as a group? So that was really the focus of how I thought about citizenship and citizenship regimes in the past, who was included, how they were included, okay, this is about another book, I won't go into the details, but what this project and this trip to Central America reminded me of is that when we think about citizenship in the political science comparativist literature, shockingly, we oftentimes forget to think about a prior condition of citizenship, which is the right to be free from harm. Right? So maybe you can sneak it into civil rights. But there's a basic Cabezian oversight, which is that when we think about citizenship, there should be the presumption that you have a state that protects you from harm, right? that you have the right to be free from harm, a point that is so central to political theory, but again, oftentimes overlooked when people think about citizenship as just democracy, do you vote or do you not vote, um, and the like. So once we think about that, the question becomes, what are the institutions in these regimes that are supposed to be promoting citizenship? And what I want to say very quickly is that institutions matter, and laws matter at the end of the day. They're critical to how we think about citizenship. It's one of the terms of this project is to think about constitutionalism. But I want to highlight that it's not just a fact of what is written on parchment, but it's really about the kinds of states also that we have in place. Citizenship is predicated on having capable states that are present, that are doing the job that they're supposed to be in place. It's not just about regimes. It's not just about ideology. It's about that administrative, coercive apparatus that you know, Faber and others here, and the ways in which they vary in strength and capacity. And that's really what I started to want to look at. It's not just the formalism of citizenship, which I will talk about here, and I won't go into all these details about thinking about states that prohibit and regulate, and not just about the informal, but actually the ways in which democratic citizenship also coincides with the illicit. It's not just the formal rights and the informal spaces, but also these, these illicit arenas that occur, and that ultimately, I want to suggest, affect citizenship in really critical ways. So what I've done here, very quickly, is to know that the, the paper, and a lot of the work that I'm doing now, is particularly interested in the circumstances under which you have state weakness and state, maybe even state complicity, we're in this illicit arena um, and the like. I'm running through this very quickly because of the time, but again, I assume if you've read the paper, this should be um, reminding you of, of some of these points. Um, all right, so when I, meet, when I talk about the illicit, I want to reiterate here that it's nothing inherent in the processes or actors or goods that we're talking about. It's that particular arena where states regulate uh, in a particular way certain laws that say that actors, goods, practices, and economies are illegal, that they can't be produced, traded, taxed, or consumed, and the like. Again, there is nothing inherent uh, in the illicit, in the good, or the practice itself. It's about state prohibition and state regulation. And here, just to you know, wake you up, of course, our conversations about marijuana are all about what is legal and not legal. The issue of Central American migrants, again, is all about what is legal and what is not legal. The comparison between Cubans and Central Americans who come to the U.S. shore, again, highlights this question. It's nothing about migration per se. Um, it's about the laws that regulate what is, what is legal and what is not. So what the paper tries to do is to remind us of these illicit spa spaces when we think about um, citizenship in, in democracies, and then to highlight the two illicit spaces that have become particularly prevalent, particularly in the Central American context, are the emergence of gangs and organized crime that have fundamentally shaped um, spaces in critical ways here. So I'm actually going to jump over most of this conversation because of much of this in the paper, but I want to highlight a few things here. For me, the reason that gangs and organized crime are so interesting is that they are organizations that are about many, many things, but one of those things 
about controlling territory. There's a territoriality to these organizations that includes um, uh, a set of parastatal concerns about governing regions and governing economies and creating a set of relationships with people on the ground. That is not always about violence. So for those of you who have read the incredible book by Gambetta, there's nothing about being illicit or being organized crime that means violence. Other things have to come uh, into play. So the paper highlights that. And again, for those of you who know about this distinction between pandillas and maras in Central America, you could be a gang. Not all gangs are equally violent. It's the emergence of these more localized gangs into much, much more, um, uh, uh, much larger, much more hierarchical, uh, profit-seeking uh, organizations that has become critical. Okay, so I'm, I'm jumping over quite a lot. I'm sure you have questions about the lack of clarity. But what I want to move to next is to say that with these illicit spaces, and in particular, as gangs compete to control territories, and as organized criminal groups to control territories, again, it's not the emergence of the groups themselves, but the competition to control territories. We see that violence has really taken off in the region. So here, for those of you who might not know this, Latin America it now claims the most violent countries, or you could say arguably the most violent countries in the world if you look at per capita rates, particularly in Central America, particularly Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras, and if we look at them nationally, those rates would be the root. Uh, Jose Mina Cruz just came out with this uh, line in an article that I want to share with you, which is Guatemala and Honduras, for instance, had more than 5,000 homicides each during 2009. Guatemala and Honduras are tiny countries, by the way, surpassing the 4,645 murders in Iraq during the same year, while El Salvador had nearly as many. So again, it gives you a sense of the scale, absolute numbers as well as, as per capita. It's pervasive, but I want to highlight here that it's not uniform. Pervasive in Central America, but it's not pervasive in all places within countries, nor is it pervasive in the entire region. Nicaragua and Costa Rica in particular, Nicaragua is a surprise here, it's relatively low levels of violence. It's not reducible to authoritarian regimes and civil wars. Again, as the list is not violence, but there are other mechanisms in play. So here I'm going to share a graph with you, the anthropologist, I want to warn you, you are allowed to gasp when you see this, um, this blatant effort to generalize across the region. Um, but the project, oh, this just shows you that it varies in terms of stable rates and, and levels. But the project, the larger book of which I'm trying, desperately trying to finish, is essentially then trying to look at how the expansion of these illicit economies, which is much more transnationalized than people oftentimes grant, leads these actors to find spaces where those economies can flourish, seeking in particular weak uh, or corrupt states, moving into those areas, and in particular you'll find that the DTOs, I mistakenly for cartels here, are oftentimes in rural areas and ports, whereas the gangs are oftentimes in cities. Anyway, this is the project, you can gasp, but it is the sort of organizing um, principle behind the, behind the project. But what you find is, to come back to that variation, you'll see there's incredible variation within Latin America. Latin America, dark, means the highest levels compared to the rest of the world, enormously high. But what I also want to show you is the incredible variation within the regions. It's not all the countries, but a lot of the countries in the region from 95 to 2008. And if we take out Colombia and El Salvador, which are outliers in these years, gives you a sense, again, of the incredible variation uh, across, the, across the region. Central America, lest you think we should just look at countries, has incredible variation. I, should, I mentioned that Nicaragua and Costa Rica are lower. But you can see incredible variation within these cases as well. Again, the territoriality of the violence, I think, also coincides with the territoriality of some of these uh, other illicit actors, although Obviously, they're not responsible for all the violence. And again, just to help you to zoom back out, we graph the violence by um, provinces in Guatemala over many years. This gives you a sense, again, of the variation in Guatemala over time on the eastern coast. And in the then, this is, where the, this is where the Civil War largely happened in, in, in um, Guatemala. We have a similar thing for El Salvador, 
And if I could just say, this is where Blatty actually has done a lot of her research. This is actually where the violence is, is lower. Again, uh, another way of looking at this. So I wanted to step back and say, yes, democracy, yes, citizenship, but violence is incredibly critical and is incredibly territorialized. How much time do I have? Less than six, if I haven't given you Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, so maybe I'll speak just a little bit slower, but maybe not. <laughs> okay. So what I want to highlight here then is that these numbers are telling us something, even though I want us to be cautious about the numbers. The numbers are representations of a violence that has actually continued to affect many countries in the region, particularly what's called the Northern Triangle of Central America, Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras. But also, as you know from the pages of the New York Times, it's increased dramatically in Mexico, it's increased recently in Venezuela, it has also been um, high and low depending on regions and parts of Brazil. There's an issue across the region. So what I think these figures help us to think about is not just that violence is a concern, but that it is critical when we think about democratic citizenship in this third wave of the region to move beyond the formalism of democratic institutions, to move beyond the formalism of electoralism, and to remember that there's a very uneven space. Again, repeating for the end of time, I'm saying here particularly in terms of how the illicit has affected uh, these dynamics. And in that realm, that requires us to think much more seriously than I think many Latin Americans in political science have done recently, to actually think about the coercive institutions that define the state in the democracies that are on the ground, and to think about the degree in which they are both required to defend citizenship, and as I'll say at the end, in the same ways that they have also seriously undermined it and, and, uh, and uh, violently uh, uh, Find the words and imagining all these horrible things. Violently engaged in human rights abuses and the like. Number one. Number two, I think it requires us to remember again that these are not just countries, that there is an incredible uneven patterns within cases. And again, Lucky is going to share with us so much of her kind of work, which goes much beyond this. And that part of this dynamic then is not just that people are potentially victims of violence, but that people's fear on a day to day basis is so high, and again, so striking, given the human rights abuses that many of these countries faced in earlier regions, earlier periods. So this just gives you a sense, the thing about um, barometer is a survey that happens oftentimes in the region, and they ask these questions about perceived guarantee of freedoms. And you can see that the sense that protection against crime is the lowest, relative to many other questions that were asked, freedom of religion, people feel pretty good about that. But protection against crime is the lowest, lower even than opportunities to get a job. Right? So this is a concern that people have in their central way. And then just another figure, again, I mentioned Jose Miguel Cruz, who's one of the people who's worked on this in Central America and worked with Latino you know, uh, Americans rather uh, data in particular. Here is a, I think a really interesting, devastating table because the question is about do you think that the police is basically protecting you from crime? Right? That's the institution of the state that on a day-to-day -day basis is supposed to be guaranteeing your freedom from harm. And so perceptions of police, and not even that, the questions of perceptions of police involvement in crime uh, in Latin America, and you can see, or if you can't see so well, I can very <coughs> um, you know, it's over 60% perception of police is involved in crime in Guatemala, Venezuela, Bolivia, etc. These are surveys you can't fully um, Accept all everything you're saying, but the, the magnitude is so high, it is incredibly concerning. Again, in that piece that Jose uh, Miguel um, wrote that I cited earlier, he says, and I quote, a regional survey conducted by Vanderbilt in 2008 found that 66% of Guatemalans, 49% of Salvadorans, and 40% of Armenian Hondurans believe that the police were implicated in police activities. All right, so I'm just going to start to wrap this up. So I think this has many implications, some of which I've already highlighted. One is that citizenship is more than democracy, and citizenship is more than that tripartite reference to rights that we oftentimes use when we think about citizenship with T.H. Marshall. It's about Marshall, but it's also about Hobbes, and it's also Hobbes being security, and it's also about favor, which is that you need 
capable states if we're going to talk about a meaningful citizenship uh, moving forward. It requires that you pay attention, obviously, to citizens' voices. It requires that you think about the state in its formal uh, aspect. And this is one of the curious questions, as well as how it interacts with the informal and the illicit. And it requires us to think about, of course, of apparatus. But I want to end with a dilemma before I raise just a couple of questions. So I've already hinted at, which is this is actually normatively and politically such a thorny question. Because if the very institutions that you're turning to to defend security are the very institutions that took it away in the past, how do you move forward? How do you move forward? And here I think that the comparison within Central America is fascinating because Nicaragua, and this is the empirical comparison in the book that I'm focusing on, is the case, despite incredible problems of state capacity and corruption uh, and the like, despite the history of civil war, despite patterns of inequality, has relatively low patterns of violence. And moreover, people respect the head of the police, her name is Anita Granera, People from all sides of the political spectrum would say, you know, she has inimistica. She knows something about her that, that transcends the, the politics of the past. She's committed to the enterprise of providing a rule of law for all. That's a fascinating story. I'm coming up against my time, but I will say, Salvadoran insurgency, whom I've known since we were both in our early 20s. 
That day I also met with Chayu's daughters, Victoria and Lucinda, who I hadn't seen since they were 11 and 9, living in the rural countryside of El Salvador. Their trajectories illuminate the many contradictions of post war in El Salvador, but for this opening with you, it's their children, those born in the U.S., and the ones that cross borders with their young mothers, that embody the legacies of El Salvador's war and post-war. For example, Victoria's son has written about his migration journey for two school projects. The first year, he narrated his crossing in Spanish, and last year, Victoria proudly tells me, he wrote it in English. She's had two babies in the U.S., and most recently, her partner's daughter, Michelle, has joined the household. Indeed, on that hot day in July, I was introduced to a lanky 11-year-old beauty wearing graphic tee, tight jeans, and bejeweled flip-flops. Michelle had been caught on that border the week before. I would have never guessed. She had been released to kin here in the United States while her uncle, who she had been traveling with, remained in a deportation center in Texas. At times, these images of disheveled, dirty, and panicked children, along with the squalor of their shelters, frames unaccompanied Central American youth within a conception of vulnerable humanity rooted in what Didier Fassin illuminates as the moral compassion of our time. However, the heated politics of immigration reform and border security, for others, these same bodies are read in a continuum of dehumanizing illegality. In both of these renditions, not surprisingly, regional histories are shortened and flattened. Gangs, maras, amnesias, and their empirical acts of extreme violence are described as the key factors propelling bodies into the U.S. and the making of the border crisis. Thus, for El Salvador, a long time seen as the success story the ma of the United Nations brokered peace, is depicted as a contemporary, bloody, terrifying, and insecure place more than 20 years into post-war. Most importantly, this chaos threatens to leak into the United States. Like many, I want to caution against a facile account of the supposed Salvadoran culture of violence as a legacy of war, yet simultaneously acknowledge the politics of this violence. Of course, many are trying to understand post-war violence, locating it within larger structural, historical, gendered, and raced political economic processes as the story of Cold War U.S. support supported in counterinsurgency recedes from view. And today, I think we've got actually another model to think through. But my own anthropological work asks us to consider the relationship between war, post-war, and migration. Mine is a focus on the everyday living through of aftermaths for residents and migrants from a war, former war zone. We need to remember, though, that shortly after the 1992 signing of Accords, when I first traveled to El Salvador, this idea of the post-war, post-conflict, all things <coughs> post, were actually temporally very present, and the field of transitional justice was just emerging. In the heavily FMLN communities, um, the insurgents in which I worked, being in power, in poder, meaning winning the presidency, was still a rallying call, not an institutional reality as it is today with the election of two FMLN presidents. In my longer paper, and as Deborah sort of mentioned for us and, and summarized so nicely, I've come to analyze this period in terms of the entangled aftermaths of post-war. My work is based on longitudinal ethnographic research in the northeast of El Salvador, the map. <laughs> uh, in the rural deforested hills of the department where folks were insurgents and supporters. It's also based on ethnographic interviews with Charateco migrants who start making the journey to the U.S. only at the turn of the 20th, 21st century, 10 years into the post-war period, and who I argue deterritorialize their participatory democracy. Much of my work has been concerned with exploring engendered disillusionment and the continuities of displacement and, and uh, clandestinity. But I feel that analytically, you need to ask what doesn't get said about El Salvador. So why, for example, the illusion of trauma in aftermaths, it's not a language that is articulated, the lack of human rights framings and humanitarian logics, why the privileging of development, reconstruction, and reintegration as markers of democracy, so much in El Salvador is loaded, guns and all. So I want to think through what John Jackson elsewhere has discussed as the always already racialized and embodied overdetermined markers that are deployed to tell a story. What kinds of bundling of markers, violence among them, abound for Salvador in post-revolutionary and post-war bodies? In writing against these, what other narratives can we tell? One way to think about the post-war is through what anthropologist Diane Nelson suggests is a study of milieu, that in the Guatemalan case is about reckoning, 
or rather about the impossibility of what she says, measuring up for settling accounts. So she suggests a nation duped, similar to the engaño or deceit that I found circulating through Chalate. Yet I know Victoria Sanford's long-standing work that illuminates the multiple ways in which survivors of the Guatemalan genocide continue to fight against impunity in that search for truth and justice as they mobilize to hold perpetrators accountable for their dead, including the historic yet derailed trial of Rios Montt for the crime of genocide. Sanford suggests that the wall of impunity is starting to crack. It is still a battle in El Salvador because of the sweeping 1993 amnesty law that has held steady since the findings of the UN Truth Commission report. Despite current challenges to the law, in El Salvador, perpetrators have not been prosecuted and reparation programs have not been institutionalized. Many argue that there is no justice. As my colleague anthropologist Ralph, Ralph Sprenkel's work cogently reminds us, the amnesty law not only benefited the leadership on the right and the FMLN, but also the human rights organizations closely aligned with the left. And as historians, uh, Spaniards, Rey Tristan y Lasso tell us, this is a model of reconciliation via impunity that spawns, as they say, una reconciliación sin reconciliados, a reconciliation without the reconciled. I find this really powerful. What does it mean to have a reconciliation without the reconciled? How to build from contentious past memories and experiences in this context. As a way to think through this question, I've been following the public opinion polls about violence, policy research on the prevention of violence, and census data on violent deaths, and there's much of this in El Salvador. It is true violence is rampant and ranges from everyday extortion in neighborhoods, assassinations, gender-based violence, to the assault of local buses, most dramatically seen in the 2010 horrific massacre where 17 Salvadorans were killed in a burning bus. Scholars such as anthropologist Ellen Moody explain the ways in which El Salvador after peace is characterized, as Deborah Scher nicely put it, as an anxious and depoliticized uncertainty that resignifies violence discursively into common crime, so this idea of the random. Today, according to that National Civilian Police, which folks don't have much faith in, 60% of homicides in El Salvador are committed by gangs. By the close of 2014, there were 61 Homicides were 100,000 inhabitants for a total of 3,912 in 2014. I've been thinking about these numbers and how they get deployed in conversations, not only about Salvadoran culture of violence, but also about a, quote, culture of democracy, as was pursued in a 2012 USAID-funded project. What is it about the possibility of the one for the other? In these studies, insecurity is the lens through which El Salvador is understood. A 2012 public opinion poll indicates that 38% of the population says that insecurity is the most urgent issue in their community. Another report tells us that 6 out of 10 Salvadorans say that the crime is the country's main problem. But there are our rural and urban distinctions. Salvadorans in the countryside actually define insecurity as economic. But it is the Atlas of Violencia in Salvador 2009-2012, the third atlas produced since the turn of the 21st century, that yields some striking data. It appears that the most vulnerable age groups include 15 to 19-year-olds who constitute 20% of the nation's homicides. But really, people, mostly men, are at risk through the age of 34. Furthermore, disaggregating data by departments, like states, helps us think about the geographies of post-war violence. Why is it that former highly organized wartime regions, such as Chalate and Morazan, the two like, yellow colors in her, in her slide, um, have the lowest national homicide rates? Does direct experience of war violence create, quote, cohesion, as suggested by scholars Garni and Ware? I'm not sure. In the municipality of Las Huertas, where I've conducted my research, no one was killed in 2009, 2010, or 2011. No one was killed in 2012. At first, I thought I knew who that was, but after carefully checking over my field notes, I see that it was actually the near murder of a former insurgent that I was thinking about. He didn't make it into the atlas, but yes, into a coma. With all of this, I'm specifically interested in working with what Goldstein, Daniel Goldstein, an anthropologist, writes about in his book, Outlawed. He discusses an everyday insecurity where people, quote, occupy a habitus of fear and uncertainty that is at once social, psychological, and material. 
and where insecurity is, quote, a sense of the world is unpredictable, out of control, and inherently dangerous, and that within this chaos, the individual must struggle desperately just to survive, end quote. But it is also a time, as Didier Fassin's work suggests, where, quote, dialectic of repression and compassion lie at the heart of contemporary politics, end quote. This is what he termed humanitarian reason. For Fassin, today's global governance is marked by a moral politics of compassion that in fact masks and allies deep inequalities. I wonder how this humanitarian logic articulates with the dialectic, dialectic of rights and security in places such as El Salvador, and for the Salvadorans whose post-war framing is actually not of the universalized suffering body. I ask this because in other comparative contexts marked by political violence and later disaster, such as Haiti, interventions and democratization are framed in humanitarian terms. And I talk about that in both of my pieces a little more. So today then, if El Salvador is a diseased political body, as described by one report, violence and epidemiological epidemic, as defined by the World Health Organization, Salvadorans insecure and statistically men on the streets and women in their homes, Childhoods unstable at borders and at home via abandoning parents, why is it that the humanitarian logic doesn't quite work? This rather recent framing of the care for the stranger. Perhaps it is because the insecurity of aftermaths is marked by chronicity, as Philippe Bourgois and Jeff Schomburg suggest about suffering which is, quote, chronic and cumulative and both personal and structural. Does this chronicity jut up against those overdetermined markers of violence, that suffering subject, that scarred body that ties up the moral and the medical in the now? I believe that ethnography can help us theorize Salvadoran insecure and precarious lives and futures. Goldstein reminds us that we can understand the, quote, disposition of the neoliberal subject in the security society as one of perpetual alertness, end quote where folks are always on guard, ready for emergency, and for threats around every literal and figurative bend. For the variously positioned protagonists of the Salvadoran struggle, I wonder if we also need to think about embodied experiences of agentive alertness. Um, so here I'm thinking of Fanon's discussion. I was in a seminar last year where we read a lot of Fanon. Where the, coloni where the quote, colonized subject is always on his guard. The muscles of the colonized are always tensed. It is not that he is anxious or terrorized, but he is always ready to change his role as game for that of hunter. For the, for the Chattanooga self-identified revolutionary combatant and supporter, this alertness was linked to a revolutionary security, a security of territory. So actually, I really think we need to talk about territory. A control over geographical perimeters. The securing of insurgent spaces was scaled up by the disciplining and regulating of obedient bodies. In a context of reconciliation, without the reconciled, I wonder about the embodied practices of denial, those breaks with the mobilized past, away from Fanon's productive alertness, in order to secure integration into the productive economy, which has failed. So, here's some ethnography. In February of 2012, I returned to Chalacanango and met up with many women and men I hadn't seen in 15 years, though in many cases I had met their kin in the US. Many of the women were still economically insecure, single heads of household, others had left their partners, some had been deserted by migration. So Esmeralda was in a new home, displaced from her house in a plot of land when she left her husband, a local curandero or healer. She told me he had gone crazy again from war, from drink. There were just too many beatings. I was unclear if she meant hers or his from the war. As we caught up, I met her growing children, the youngest was cognitively disabled and motor impaired, and really no longer very small. Of her 10 kids, two lived in the US, and her daughter, Raquel, was thinking of crossing the border with her cherub-like infant um, in order to keep her husband, who had recently migrated, from strain, something that is not uncommon. I don't know if Raquel crossed alone and with her baby. It is often difficult to keep in touch with Salvadoran migrants, many who are always on the move and change phone plans often. But I did learn about Raquel's father, that local curandero, carpenter, and artist whose vibrant paintings depict military battle in an adventure the community I worked in on smooth slats of wood. They are reproduced in my first book and grace my office wall, Marvin. Muse and Diaspora Travels, 
During that same July visit with Chayu that I mentioned in the opening of this paper, we discussed so many insecure things. Her husband's ill health, exacerbated by the pressure of his fortunate liminal legal status. With TPS, he could have all the bills in his name. Her hope to start a business thwarted by her own illegal, undocumented, unauthorized status. The longing for her remarkable son in Chalate, the first of this peasant family to make it to university. And we talked about Marvin. Rumor has it that Marvin was consorting with some odd elements in Erbacho, not really Magas, but this too is unclear. Chayo had heard that Marvin's wife, Esmeralda, kicked him out of the home. He was seeking revenge and planned to kidnap her for a ransom. This too seems far-fetched. Chayo explains that Marvin planned the kidnapping with some local youth and, quote, unos muchachos hondureños. There is illicit movement on Hondurans escaping the law into this region of Chalate for sure. However, rather than capture Esmeralda, the muchachos, also a term used to denote the insurgents of the past, turned on Marvin and brutally assaulted him with knives, leaving him for dead in a pit originally dug for his wife. After months in a coma in a departmental hospital, Marvin was released minus one eye. This, too, is a story of post-war violence that doesn't fit so neatly into the rubrics that quantify and seek to measure how where and why people feel insecure, what deaths and near deaths matter. As Michael Tausig offers for ethnography, quote, sometimes when you write, field notes, time stands still and an image takes its place. I don't think he means this as an analytic paralysis, but that is a concern. There are so many halting images of a post-war that does not stand still, but this one, imagined, of Marvin, one-eyed and crazy, without pin, while his severely impaired son lies on a hammock rocked by his mother, throws me. Can we think about that relationship between an everyday complicated violence, insecurity, and a gentle alertness differently? I've been thinking here specifically about what Deborah Thomas suggests in exceptional violence as an archive of counter-narratives. <clears throat> and so I end with another migrant story, a counter-narrative to precarity, insecurity, and injustice as lived through the fr frictions of post-war. In my complicated work and friendship with Salvadorans in the diaspora, I am struck by the everyday, intimate negotiations that unexpectedly rub up against the profound lack of accountability in post-war. And though it makes me politically anxious, I am thinking about these as deep territorializing practices of forgiveness in the after of war. So I'll leave you with this. When I was last in Los Angeles in the summer of 2012, I visited Flor, who I first met in Chalatenan when she was nine years old. Her mother was a local, everyday women's organizer and one of Chayo's neighbors. I have written about Flor as an obligated migrant, but today I believe that her trajectory speaks best to the relationship between security, chronicity, and perhaps humanitarian logics. Indeed, we can trace the cycles of her ever-changing insecurity her clandestinity as a child of the FMLN and as an unauthorized migrant. She has lived through so many losses of kin and home. I detail them in the paper a little more. In the meantime, she has built a home in LA and has two daughters, though her partner was recently deported. From Flor's vulnerable space, it may be the configurations of ritual kin, kin that provide respite from insecurity. In 2012, like so many Salvadorans, Flor and her partner worked multiple jobs and long hours. They shared a home with a Salvadoran couple that had become their daughter's godparents. In talking about daily life and how she juggles what we would call the gendered work-family balance, Flor shared a compelling story about making family. It turns out that one of her daughter's kindergarten assignments was to draw a picture of her family. Jennifer happily drew a picture of herself with her two moms and her two dads. The parents that took her to school in the morning and the ones that picked her up at the end of the day, her biological parents and her godparents. It is only later, on another day, during another conversation, that I learned that Jennifer's godfather had served in the Salvadoran military during the war. Indeed, he had been stationed in the northeast of Chalate at around the same time that Flor Guerrillero, platoon leader father, was ambushed and killed. Institutional, historic, and it was of the past. I asked them if stories about the war ever came up for them. They said no. I was thinking about the living through and enact enactment of reconciliation. Jennifer's godfather explained that Flor was simply too young to remember. 
I don't think this is the case. Among the first objects Flor requested from El Salvador many years ago now is a copy of a picture of her father in olive green with two guns strapped on his back. Like other stories, this one is silenced and in that space emerges a way to survive and make sense of an everyday insecurity. Today I offer that it is in these contradictions, in living through them, that forgiveness or reconciliation without the reconciled happens despite living memories of war, across generations, across geographies, so that a little girl can have two moms and two dads, at least for a while. Security 
would look like as a time. And, and, you know, so that's a very recent actually development, I think, for at least El Salvador, I'm not sure, for the rest of the region. So I think that's where a really um, a fruitful place to sort of make it begin to move through. These are such interesting questions. I'm trying to think of how to contain myself in the response. Um, I'm going to talk about them in sequential order of um, the, the way they present just in terms of territoriality and the, um, the way in which it's moved in recent years, or your, your comment about the the movement of that over time and over place. There, there are a couple things that I didn't talk about today, although Tulia and I were talking about it a little bit earlier, which is that there is an international dimension that's really critical in these conversations. And it's critical, particularly for the work that I've been doing in terms of crackdown on illicit economies. So when there's a crackdown in the Caribbean, it moves to Mexico. When there's a crackdown in Mexico, it moved even further into Central America. So the drug literature, there is a drug literature, refers to it as the balloon effect. Mm -hmm. But it's essentially this idea that coercion in one place is not contained within your own borders. It actually has a spillover effect in many other kinds of places. The crackdown itself leads to an increase in the violence as part of the competition, but it also can have that um, spillage over time and literally over space. But the second thing that I'll just throw out, um, I don't know quite how it fits in, but I've done a, earlier work that I did was on indigenous movements and, and the mobilization around ethnic lines. And there, I think there also is a territoriality of identities that were overseen by the state and then become politicized in common ways. So what I think, just to brainstorm with you out loud, I think that territoriality can mean many different things to many different people, obviously. We oftentimes flatten it in a too deep way on the map and think about it in borders in terms of security, but it obviously affects people's identities, it affects their sense of economic security, it affects their sense of a whole set of issues. Um, and actually, if I could make a plug, there's a beautiful book that's about to come out about by Eric Simmons that looks at some of this in terms of what commodities also mean in the context of territorial insecurity. So that's just one thought. In terms of insecurity, I was really struck by in your comment and what in your presentation actually but the, that word means so many different things to different people and over time. So Deborah, you I think you were referring it at one point in terms of the security of our borders. It's a very military understanding oftentimes. I'm not saying we per se we're saying that, but we oftentimes have a military understanding of security or insecurity is your fear, your fear about what your border neighbor is going to do in terms of transgressing or, or um, crossing those boundaries. I think in the way that I was using it in, in today's presentation, it was largely about the freedom from harm. But Lotte also reminded us this also used often in terms of economic insecurity uh, on a day-to-day -day level. And I think in the dynamic of putting all those things together, what is most striking to me is that the fear of violence and a sense of not being protected has surpassed economic concerns. Now, that could be a function of the way the questions are asked, because oftentimes if you break it apart in terms of fear of inflation, fear of unemployment, fear of, of, of subsistence, you might find that those are lower down. If you were to put them together and say, do you, are, do you have basic economic concerns? Who knows? You might get a different response. But the sense is that has changed. And then the last thing I just want to throw out is that one of the strike, there are two striking responses to this, bottom up and top down, to use um, some of your language. One has been the increasing turn to the military to provide security. Now, this is, I'm speaking normatively here, it's a very frightening thing to ask the military to come in and do what you would expect your police to do because that bright line that you need between civilian and that military um, deployment of power is no longer clear. But it's, and it's recalling some of the dynamics of the authoritarian period. But one response is to militarize, and that's happened throughout the region. Um, but the second, and this is something that's been happening for at least a decade, is the increasing terms of what's referred to as citizen security, and an effort to devolve the responsibility or part of that responsibility back to everyday citizens, right? It's literally called citizen security to be able to provide some kind of policing function or 
or channeling information to the police to be able to provide that. And Benito Gonzalez has just finished a dissertation looking at the different kinds of participatory security that was actually come back to the language we talked about, the different ways in which citizens are asked to participate and, and what the causal consequences of that are. Because just because you ask citizens to participate, doesn't necessarily mean you get the, necessarily a quote, quote, good outcome. It might just be that the police is devolving responsibilities to people who no longer have the ability to do anything. But ideally, there would be a communication that would be, um, you know, there is an ideal out there. The question is there's variation across the region. So yeah, that's a series of meandering thoughts in response to an interesting comments. Yeah, and just to piggyback, you know, the interesting thing about, so El Salvador is known as sort of for following a very zero tolerance kind of um, Malaluda, Iron Fist um, policies during the Arena regime. But I think what's interesting in the, one of the most recent statistics, because what I found fascinating was this explosion of kind of public opinion work that's being done by, funded by USAID, USAID, FLAXO, all these actually very reputable, known, like incredible places. Um, and then one of the findings was that, in fact, in terms of uh, public opinion, about insecurity, security, and faith in institutions was that the Fuerzas Armadas, the, the army, actually was ranked very high in El Salvador for faith in that particular, the church, Fuerzas Armadas, and uh, Women's a Women's Institute. So I was, I'm still trying to like figure it, but I found you know, that really fascinating. Also, in the context of the Policia Nacional CV, which was a hallmark of the peace accord. So part of the peace accord uh, was that actually the police system was entirely reformed. So a lot of actually work has gone in, the, in El Salvador to try to understand what has happened with you know the 33% former FMLN um, um, cadets who were at the, you know, the beginning of the peace process that it had to have, it had to be a, a new civilian police force that was for the people. Mm -hmm. um, and that what has happened in the last 20 years is this massive, um, you know, various scandals and just but a general feeling by public opinion polls that the PNSA is actually, like as your statistics show, um, some of your analysis around, you know, there's just no faith in that institution despite the fact that it was completely recalibrated in the post war period. Can I just add one? Because this actually I think gets back to your comment, Deborah, about the dynamics of this, which is that this is such an interesting point that you raised, that in El Salvador in particular, that this was picked up by other places, the state citizens voted in presidents who had this Manobura policy to try and crack down and was very uh, uh, um, violated a lot of civil liberties uh, along the way. The consequence actually was to professionalize the gangs that they were oftentimes trying to pick up. And this is a dynamic that's not peculiar to El Salvador. It's actually their arguments that the same thing happened in Chicago in the 1970s. So Ben Katesh and Levitt, who, you know, the more popular version, but have also written academic studies about this, have highlighted that when you cracked down on some of these organizations, they just became more professional and they used the networks that were created in to be able to, that made them, the language that Ben Kitesh uses, they became less of a family, like the Bandias, mm -hmm. and they became more of an economic enterprise that was about securing profit. When they get out, or when they're negotiating from, out, from the prison to the outside, as in Brazil, that's where a lot of the more violent and economically motivated violence has, has taken off. So there are parallels, there's an incredible dynamic in El Salvador, but it has parallels in Brazil, it has parallels in Um, why don't we open up? I'm sure you all have a lot of questions. I think I'm just a little bit of other people go first. But, uh, I guess I have, uh, I have many questions, but, but, but I narrowed down to two. Um, you had asked us they were, what would the post legal security look like? So, you know, I want to refer to your previous uh, work to perhaps um, rephrase uh, that and also building up on, on one of your last comments. Um, I wonder what a plurinational security would look like. Mm -hmm. if, if, if 
by liberal women uh, in nation, in nation state type of security, you know, the very idea that there was this uh, monopoly over the legitimate use of force, that now the pro national state with the advent of ethnicities um, or the processes of decentralization of police and citizen uh, vigilantes and whatnot is also uh, challenging. What is that more decentralized, more plurinational in some cases? scenario would like. So I wonder whether this is a different path than the one that you described in terms of the paradox. Because your paradox had to do with the fact that the, the very institutions that have to uh, that have to protect us are the ones who crush us before. And in some cases, you know, perhaps not in the summer, but in many cases the the the, the intentions uh, institutions, the, the, the security apparatus has not changed that much. Um, but this is another paradox. There have also <coughs> been uh, political changes um, and policy changes that challenge that idea of centralized authority. So, you know, I wonder if that's another way of sort of thinking about what the political security would look like. I mean, if you have any thoughts, I know you posed it as a question, but, but I, I'm assuming that perhaps you thought about it. Um, and then perhaps wrongly thought <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I wanted to, well, at least you know you, you thought about this, you know, post liberalism a lot, because you were one of the first ones to propose it. Um, um, if not the first one. Uh, Loti, I, I wanted to ask you about uh, the humanitarianism. And, and here is where you know, our disciplinary uh, barriers, unfortunately, um, make the conversation hard. I haven't read Fasim's book uh, or work, so you know I, 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 I'm handicapped here. But from what I read in your in your work, uh, and, and particularly the other piece mm -hmm. the one that was published, you seem to have a very uh, critical view of the humanitarian turn. Um, and and I, I wonder, you know, what's the alternative, right? You, your last vignette had to do with this uh, girl who uh, could have been a militante, but clearly now is a victim, or you know, at least is trying to uh, be reconciled as, as you know, in, in this uh, place of, of not discussing what happened, uh, that that the humanitarian and victim, the, the idea of victimizing. Uh, those who were activists um, uh, may put her in. So, so I, I, I get your your critique, I think, uh, and I may share it. But I wonder where does that leave us if we you know, do away with the idea that that, that uh, there is a humanitarian response possible to these? What would be the alternative? Um, yeah, that's a great question, and you know, I think I'm still wrestling with it because um, one of the things that has really struck me is, is the way in which certain questions get asked of certain regions. And so, as I've been doing this research, um, and there, had, there was a real turn, I think, in anthropology to think through kinds of questions of the moral. Um, and so, Miriam Tickton talks a lot about sort of the shifts. She's good. I, I like her work. Um, about sort of the, the space of uh, humanitarianism and anthropology, and sort of, um, and so we have like people like Peter Redfield, who does a, a an ethnography on Médecins uh, Sans Frontières, like Doctors Without Borders, an ethnography that kind of work. Um, I think where anthropology more generally is in in this conversation, from doing the work, critiquing humanitarianism to now a more ambiguous and sort of open relationship to it. I don't think I, I have a, a, a direct answer to that. What I do often wonder is the, you know, and I'm specifically struck, of, it's only when Salvador bodies come in and threaten the US borders that it's a humanitarian crisis. And so that language that was elided for years, and so in, in both pieces that I circulated, um, why is it that someone like Erica Cable James can do this incredible ethnography in Haiti, where you have the you have the kind of entanglement of militarization, humanitarianism, and processes of democratization that didn't emerge in the same way? So for me, thinking about humanitarianism, 
brings into it a conversation of there, because of the supposed agency of militantes and insurgents in El Salvador, there's no space for trauma. There is no space for the suffering body. Because as my larger work sort of demonstrates, is that the hegemonic narrative is one of martyred bodies, heroic. Everyone wanted to participate because they wanted to, right? But now, 20 years later, other narratives are possible. And so new work being done actually delineates the spaces of contention, where people actually talk about now in the region that I worked in, not to me, but to other differently positioned ethnographers, about the forced conscription, right? In a way that just was, you could not talk about in the early 90s. Um, so what I said in this last piece, this idea that I'm politically anxious to talk about forgiveness in, so I don't read that story of Flor and her daughter in the U.S. as victim or suffering, but this new kind of space and a new kind of logic that is possible um, in the U.S. context that would not be possible in El Salvador, that kind of negotiation of chronic, it's chronic loss and chronic sorrow and chronic agency, I think that you can't have that in a framework of humanitarianism because it's about the, the, the moral, medical body of the urgent crisis. And so for me, the insecurity of El Salvador, thinking about the diaspora and the long, the long lives of people and their children is about that chronicity that just doesn't fit in, a, in the logic of immediate crisis. And so I think then what happens is it's only a crisis because of a variety of reasons that I tried to map out. So I don't, you know, so I'm still thinking through what, I don't have an alternative model to think through, but I do think that we have moved anthropology and sort of its interest in moral claims is trying to make sense about, um, and simultaneously critique, but sometimes work alongside. Humanitarian projects. Sorry, can I just follow up? Yeah, yeah, follow up here. So, yeah, so, I said it wrong. I think the piece that you are precisely elaborating upon is what you meant here, which, you know, I, I didn't quite understand, but, but now perhaps I do. In page nine, you say, uh, said differently, the failures of post war deter. They, Deterritorialize participatory democracy and speak to change agents of the past. So what you seem to be saying is the alternative to humanitarianism to you know respond to the crisis here and now, you know, go to Salvador and, and these people are victims and can't help and you know, But they didn't, but that's actually not how it was framed anyways, right? Yeah, but or you know, yeah, yeah. in other places, but but you know, the, the development uh, policies that you describe, you know, I will not worship someone else. Um, uh, the alternative to that is that you migrate to a different space, and this is perhaps what you mean by the failures of, of post-war deterritorializing. Yeah. Uh, that what would have been a participatory democracy at home and changing the, the, the you know the issues of change in the past now are elsewhere, and they are you know workers uh, selling uh, twenty four seven, you know, just yeah. trying to to make ends meet and, and forgetting what happened before and, and living with what could have been the torturers of, of yeah. their, their, their family members. But I think what I'm trying to do is kind of show the complexities of that because it's actually in that I didn't I don't I don't want to give a romantic depiction. The folks that I work with romantic actually. Right. Yeah. So <laughs> that's why I try to be a little more hopeful this time. Deb knows that I'm like, you know, maybe depressive or something, but you know. But what I'm what I'm trying what I'm what I'm trying to do there is show that the folks that I worked in the 1990s had would have this was not at all the plan of transition. This was not the plan of post you know like you know so so when I when I've talked to folks now who've been in the U.S. for you know some of them 12 years 10 years or so they you know we talked about um, the kind of this. There are, there are their longitudinal arc and their their space of insurgency, and it wasn't in the plan that that's why they sacrificed their lives, their communities, their bodies, so that they themselves or their children could flip burgers at McDonald's. However, that's not necessarily only a dark space. That's sort of what I use in my other, in my book, sort of this idea of the frictions that emerge on a Singh's idea, but those sort of unanticipated kind of 
positive moments despite such structural violence, maybe, would be another way to think about it. So in that space, there's a, a you know, something. Could, could I just, um, because it ties into, I think, what you were saying, too, Jane, and, and just going to raise it very, very briefly, is I think part of also um, what the absence of space for trauma does is also um, create a barrier to any real discussion of exhaustion. And I think yeah. that's what your work points out so well in, uh, in a Central American civil yeah. war yeah. context mm -hmm. is the people who um, many of us have worked with, you know, spend 10 years, um, you know, fighting for a political vision, martyring themselves, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, then, and then suddenly the developmentalist person comes in and asks them to, to renew that level of participation mm -hmm. in a um, self-regulating new regime of citizenship. And I think that stymies any discussion of how exhaustion, moral, physical, spiritual, economic, <coughs> um, really influences the, the uh, you know, a notion of security, you know, insecurity, um, the extent to which they feel themselves holders of rights. Um, and, and I think that's a, an important element of the discussion about humanitarianism also is because it doesn't recognize that long-term mm -hmm. aspect of it. Thank you for saying So I have two quick sideboard stars about this conversation and then I'll come back to this one is I'm struck by a, a memory of being in the Philippines, um, where I spent a little bit of time, and they showed the play by Ariel Dorfman called Down in the Name. I don't know how many of you have seen it, but it was a play that was written that was trying to deal with how you overcame the violence of the past and whether or not, and how you dealt with the fact that you might have neighbors who themselves were involved in torture. And I don't I think it's okay to give the end away, because it's not for a long time. But the, the play <laughs> the play ends and the lights come up and there's a mirror on stage and the idea is that you're supposed to be reflecting about who your neighbors actually are in the play itself. So you're watching this thing with a distance and then all of a sudden they turn the play back on you. Alright, so why am I bringing this up? It's not just about the reflection moving forward. Um, but I want to come back to the deterritorialization. I don't know if I can even say that word. Um, Faster and also about generations because in the Philippines I saw this play which I had read many times before with a bunch of school stu um, uh, students from uh, lower school from an elementary school they couldn't stop giggling and I thought I kept on thinking is it because generationally they can no longer identify with it or is it because the narrative that is being projected is a is of a particular violence and they don't identify with that violence. The story itself has been deterritorialized, but also different generations are going to respond to that differently. So that's one anecdote. The other anecdote is about the development narrative that you're referring to, a very good friend of mine who's very involved in um, uh, uh, many different kinds of social movements during the military period, subsequently moved into development work. And he kept on complaining about how it's great we get all this money to do development. But then they have a checklist of what they want to have happen. And they're not recognizing that the process itself is consequential, even if they're not getting the, the things on the checklist that they want. It was an account that was a constant source of, of conversation. So it's not only the participation, which I hadn't really thought about, so interesting, but it's also this sense of being told what is productive and successful and not letting communities to decide on their own. Okay, back to your, your, your question. Um, for those of you who might not remember, because that was a few minutes ago, it was about thinking about post-liberal security in light of a, um, a plurinational society. So there are a few things I want to say about this, which I think are really interesting. First, the violence that we've seen in the region, the highest levels of violence that we see in Latin America tend not to be happening overwhelmingly in the countries that have the highest level of ethnic diversity. So certainly in Guatemala and most recently in Mexico, but if you think about Ecuador and Bolivia, for example, where the indigenous movements were the strongest, these are not the cases where the violence has actually been the highest. 
Um, that's very interesting. I think it's noteworthy to say that the violence is not the most consequential in the drug producing countries. It has been more consequential in the trade and transit of those, of those commodities um, along with the Colombia and the sort of work of Colombia and the side of civil war violence um, for the moment. So the question of what a post-liberal security would look like in the context of a plurinational context um, has not come up in quite the same way. But I want to say a little thing to you because now you've got me thinking about this in a slightly different way. One is that in the conversations about a, a plurinational rule of law, there's been a distinction that has been made between law and then the coercive apparatus. I kind of threw all these together, but the police and the military work hand in hand with the, the um, Attorney General's office and the like oftentimes, and with the courts sometimes as well. But the, but the space for thinking about this has been quite different. So when you think about very national claims <coughs> that have to do with the law, and there's been a, a fair amount written about these, um, uh, for these uh, cultural, sorry, legal pluralism, legal pluralism has occurred not just in Latin America, but in India and other places, about how you harmonize very different kinds of legal systems. I think that the indigenous movements in Latin America in particular have thought quite a lot about the need to have, a, a cult, uh, to have legal pluralism, which itself is predicated on clearly defined territories within which their authorities have legal claims. But it has not necessarily, as far as I know, but I have looked at this particular question, raised the question about coercion and the state in quite the same way. And having said that, that's not totally true, in the sense that in highly resource-rich areas where the military has been present, they have asked the military to get out of the regions. If you're thinking about Ecuador, we just talked about this a little bit earlier. Um, there have been also comments about the Romulus Campesinas in, in Peru, or the Fax and the Capurias in, um, in Guatemala, uh, and the lynchings that have occurred. But those are oftentimes less about the state and more about um, just seeking uh, 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 retribution, a different kind of justice. So that raises the question that I can't quite answer of really who is responsible for enforcing the claims of a legal pluralist system, mm -hmm. and what kind of punitive mechanisms are allowed within and without. I think that the, the lawyers that I spoke to many years ago talked about the need to, uh, clearly, it's the boundaries that are complicated to define. There's certain areas, civil law is easy. You know, you get married, you get divorced. You know, those sorts of things are easier. Property claims are easier. But what happens when you're doing the homicides? What happens when you're dealing with domestic around gender issues becomes, becomes a real um, concern. And I guess I want to end on this note, and this is the concern that has been raised oftentimes when we talk about the pluralism, which is that in an environment where authority is oftentimes um, presumed to be here in men, and those public spaces where oftentimes there are public discussions are spaces that have generally been defined by men, the question is, do women have, um, let me put it in a different place, where do women have the greatest opportunity to defend their rights in a court of liberal law or in a court of customary law? And I'm not saying this in a way where I know the answer to this. I don't want to say to you that I, it's one or the other. I just want to say that this has become a source of real debate. So an anthropologist who worked in Columbia once told me that in the community where she worked, please don't generalize from this, but there was a debate about, you know, particularly in cases of domestic abuse, those women might actually find a different hearing and from her perspective, a better hearing if she went before the national court of law than if she went before the customary law. On other dimensions, it might be different, so let me give you one more example. The idea that if, if there is terrible harm, somebody's responsibility is to give back to the community is very different than the, that the retribution should be being sent to prison. So I don't know the answer, but I think that you're right here to talk, but not in the way that I was presenting here. Oh, one last thing that you could raise. In, <laughs> I've been talking about the military as the 
the, uh, in the most egregious ways, thinking about the Central American cases in particular. But actually, the Andean cases in Latin America, oftentimes the military was quite populist and progressive in terms of economic policies and the like. And oftentimes, indigenous movements have supported the um, military leaders who were in Peru, they oversaw land reforms, and that's what was the person who had implemented land reforms in Ecuador, the indigenous movement made a political mistake, but nonetheless they supported a military leader uh, who implemented a, a, a coup against uh, policies that were not seen as acceptable. So you were right that the militaries are not the same everywhere, and even self-identified progressive forces have sometimes aligned with militaries because in some cases they tend to be under-theorized in Latin American comparative literature, the militaries have been progressive. Kind of like the way that we think about Ecuador. Um, it's such a fascinating back and forth. I want to um, maybe see if we can get a few questions on the table and then uh, return to you guys just to make sure that people uh, have their points heard and that we can either you know, make sure we get yeah. everything here or in the smaller groups after. So I know both Rogers and the other questions. Go ahead. So I'm going to just brief. I was wondering about the role of international migration in them. Uh, you know, in terms of this shifting of the territories of violence, no one, this increase in violence in general coincides with migration to the U.S. And, I, and you've been in the field there, I, I don't know if this is true or not, but I read several reports that trace the origins of gangs to L.A. And, uh, and, you know, U.S. military intervention in Salvador was the main cause for migration to the U.S. And the argument is that in the, in the U.S., the, the, and, and uh, combined with deportations, uh, the argument is that the, the, that whole movement. So I wonder how you see that, you know, as a reality in these countries. And also, what does, it, what does it say about how to understand security in these countries and this, the strength of the state when they really you know, it's not just local, but also you have a, you know, the, probably the, the biggest weaknesses is in relation to the U.S. And uh, so uh, I, want, I want to, and also what does it mean for notions of territoriality when there is this continuous movement, it appears there was this, you know, feeling of this violence, both from country of origin and the U.S. and this continuous and uh, so yeah, that's what I I want to ask uh, Deborah to comment on um, uh, what's gained and lost by framing uh, her analysis as she did, focusing on concepts of citizenship and illicit activity, um, uh, illicit according to um, state laws, uh, because after all, uh, the phenomena that's uh, at the heart of your paper, the, Fiscal insecurities that human beings possess and gang violence uh, is uh, uh, not paying attention to whether people are uh, legally citizens or not. It's might this Hobbesian kind of concern might be seen as focused on uh, human beings. So, you know, what does citizenship uh, really have to do with it? Um, and uh, uh, even this category of illicit, I could tell uh, a story about. Uh, a political state in which uh, in different regions, part of the community started engaging in commodity smuggling. They acquired ridges. They began getting more and more control of territory. Uh, they uh, began organizing into armed violence uh, against what they saw as unjust uh, laws. And uh, you can say, uh, as the political authorities did, that's all illicit activity. Of course, they called it the American Revolution. And, uh, <laughs> There is a sense in which the phenomenon that you're describing might be seen uh, as a contestation against what are seen as unjust laws aided by a distant imperial power uh, that um, uh, uh, when you frame it in terms uh, of illicit activity, um, uh, there's a question, are you uh, privileging uh, a certain kind of status quo uh, political regime and not really raising the questions of uh, what kind of contestation uh, we're getting is fully. So I'm uh, pushing against conventional political science framing in terms of uh, uh, citizenship and illicit state. And it 
according to the laws of the existing states. Perhaps uh, one more question, and then we'll do another round. First and the third question together, and then I, I'm going to, and then I'll, I'm trying to think about how to respond to you. <laughs> so the, the two questions together were partially about deportation and migration happening, as well as the war on drugs and the way in which that plays out. Um, <coughs> and um, I want to make a general claim, and then I'm going to tell you about my ignorance in terms of actually responding. So the general claim is this, which is I do think that crackdowns, both the deportation and the war on drugs are examples of state crackdowns, oftentimes orchestrated by US policy, have had consequences. There's no doubt that the deportation from Los Angeles to um, El Salvador in particular uh, had an impact on the gangs. Um, literally, the, the gangs in uh, Los Angeles uh, took off um, and without even the language of life. So I think that there is a link, although, and this is now granting that I don't have full information, I'm a little bit wary about saying that it is all because of U.S. deportation. There were gangs in El Salvador previous to this. Salvadoran citizens are also agents in this process, so there has to be a perception and a decision to move into. Many of those who were deported didn't speak Spanish, so again, there had to be some kind of receiving that not only, in other words, those who were deported couldn't just act on Salvadoran territory as if it was not already a land of the state. Citizens, people were, had to also receive the differential power for sure, but I just want to be clear that yes, I think there's an impact, but it's not just a U.S. story. There is also a domestic story um, in that, in that uh, dynamic. One other cautionary note, I think some of the writing on this, and I'm not saying maybe you're, you're saying this, but I'm out oftentimes makes the claim that because it's transnational and by that it means that there has been a movement from Los Angeles to uh, El Salvador, there's oftentimes the expectation that there is a transnationalization of the command structure. And from what I've seen, unless that has changed in recent years, which is possible, that is not the case. These things tend to be much more localized. The question is who can control this particular territory and can they expand rather than in Los Angeles um, and uh, MS leadership is telling Salvador to send Salvador. So I, I think your comment is critical with a recognition that it's not only coming from abroad. There is this, this dynamic that is, that is in play. With the war on drugs, I do think that, that was a, has been a critical part of the story, and in part, Trevor, so your comment uh, raised this as well, which is that part of the war on drugs was well, twofold. One is it was cracking down on the movement from Colombia to the Caribbean, and with that crackdown, the and by um, particularly hamstringing not only the geography of the Caribbean but also cracking down on the Colombian drug trafficking organizations, they created the space for the Mexican drug trafficking organizations to take hold of particular drug routes. So whereas the Colombians came in oftentimes through. Um, Florida and the like, the Mexican drug trafficking organizations were able to control, to take space and to come through the western uh, border and through, through Texas and the like. There's no doubt that that has had an impact on the need of the transnational organizations that were concerned with the trade and transit to find the right geographies to move north and northward, primarily in the United States, but obviously also in the and the like. Um, that's why I think the state capacity was so central, because the need to find a new place was a consequence of, of the war on drugs. The question of where they were going to move, I see, is a partial reflection of which states they thought would be the most amenable. With a caveat, of course, the, the closer they were to the United States, the better it was that they needed to move it to move it northward. Um, so I, see, I think, yes, certainly, U.S. policy has had, has had, a, has had an impact in interaction other things. And if I could just add that I think someone who's done really good work actually on this particular issue is Alana Zilberg, 
um, and her book on security scapes in El Salvador sort of really tries to unpack these sort of facile. She didn't want, she talks about how she didn't want to study gangs, but it was always sort of reduced to the study of the transnational gang. So she's trying to look at the kind of the multiple layers of the security scapes that emerge in this particular moment. So it's a comment. Thank you so much. So yeah, it's, a, I mean, yeah, it's great. It's great. It's kind of a, a teasing of comment. <laughs> because the, the, I think the dominant narrative is the Absolutely. one. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. right. On to your comment, Rogers. Why did I frame it as citizenship? Well, that's what your <laughs> series is about. I already read the piece previously, so that's really not a good answer. The reason I frame it in terms of citizenship, in terms of the illicit, is it is really starts off with a very personal experience that led to this project and then an effort to try to conceptualize it in a different way. And it really is that experience that I started this talk off with, which is that everybody was debating whether or not a left of democracy was or was not functioning, but that people's experiences in these democracies, much along the lines of what the Latinos highlighted, was far removed from the institutions in place. And so in that, people were talking about whether or not there were human rights abuses, was the military back in barracks, that was a primary conversation, and also this, this example of disenchantment with what, was, what democracy was not being, was not providing. But that experience, you know, that trip that I told you about, took, what I was most struck by was that people's daily experiences as citizens was being micromanaged in ways where they, where they felt constrained. They couldn't go out at night, they couldn't take certain bus routes. In other words, there was freedom of democracy, and yet as citizens, they didn't have the freedom that you could expect citizens would have. That's an experience, it's a personal reason, it's not a theoretical argument. But that was the original um, orientation. And as I started to think about citizenship in that light, I was really struck by how constrained much of comparative literature is. Violence was understood relative to the military abuses, but not relative to security in democracies. Which then got me to think about the conversations really were moving them into formal versus informal. Informal is not the same as illicit. They can overlap, there can be lack of clarity. Again, Pudi and I talked about this a little bit earlier. But the illicit is something else that is, that is in play. So I think that's the reason was to try and to, to, to provide a, um, a more complex, it's not a very interesting answer, but a more complex understanding of how difficult citizenship was in the regimes where violence was taking off, and then to try and conceptualize that um, uh, in a slightly different way. But you then raised the question, and I was thinking about the book, The Smuggler Nation, which is partially related to some of these comments too that you were raising. The, smug, the illicit can, doesn't necessarily mean that it's immoral. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really say that today, but I think I said it in the, in the paper. There's nothing about being illegal that necessarily means that it is immoral. Mm -hmm. And for sure, the organizations that I'm looking at are playing a parastatal role. So in that sense, I agree with you that there is potentially this trajectory to think about drug trafficking organizations and the territoriality of them, and moreover, their efforts to extract taxes from people and to give social goods in return as a parastatal role. And the gangs are doing this on a much smaller scale. For sure, they literally want to control territories. And I remember in my conversations, people would say things like, well, it's better to have a gang than not, because at least the gang was providing security. If they didn't <coughs> have a gang there, then that, then that, that was a space where there could be competition to control more violence. So I agree with you. There's something, I totally know that there's something parallel to that of an effort because of this territorial <coughs> Normatively, then, am I being conservative in thinking that um, I, I don't see them as revolutionaries <laughs> when they themselves might? That it's you know sort of the freedom fighters versus the, um, the terrorists. Right? That's the language that was oftentimes rude. That's sort of what you're, you're asking. Right? Maybe they're freedom fighters rather than terrorists. Maybe they're they're revolutionaries rather than um, than rabble rousers. I don't think the drug trafficking organizations want to be the state. And the gangs actually, at least in their origins, 
don't want to be a state. What they want are these subnational territorial enclaves within which many things happen. A lot of discussion in other writings, not my own, are about the building of community and the sense of all these other things. But what I'm most interested in are the ways in which those territorial enclaves are becoming spaces to control and part to gain an economic profit that I think is generating a lot of violence. So in that sense, if you push me to be normative, even though I, I, you know, was trying not to, but is this going online, by the way? You're taking <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be posted. <laughs> I, I can edit. I will talk with you about it over dinner, but what I will say is, um, what I will say is this, which is that many of these organizations are engaging in egregious, violent behavior that is normatively problematic. And they are not trying to carve out a new state with an ideology of freedom for all. They're trying to control spaces for other other reasons. And those reasons I don't think include equity and justice for those who happen to have a right. So like a lot of the American Revolution. <laughs> 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 you know, when I was reading your, you know, this focus on the illicit actually made me think about you know, I couldn't go back to look at it. Was it Carolyn Nordstrom's? Like, you know, now how long? Like, you know, 15 years, right? Starting from shadows of war to global outlaws and the ways in which she traces out in various regions sort of those networks that would be illicit. You know, so I thought this was highly appreciated as well. Um, so we have time probably for one or two more. Um, I have a question. Do you have a question? No. <laughs> the, 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 <laughs> um, I have a question about, you both pointed to this um, geographic variation plotted in El Salvador and um, a number of different countries and the level of violence. And you mentioned, Lottie, that um, there's less violence in some areas that were stronger areas for that amount. Um, and Deborah, you mentioned the same thing, but I think you also pointed to Guatemala, but this was the case in Guatemala as well. Um, so I was curious if you could say more about that. And you mentioned body maybe the idea of social cohesion in these areas, but it was also making me think about the role of social networks um, that may be developed through um, during the process of insurgency. Um, and I was wondering whether you could say something about that. I don't have a more well formed question about the role of social networks, but I, I'm wondering if you could say more about what that role might be in terms of limiting the ability of gangs and other organizations to enter into those areas. Yes. Okay. Um, and this this question is a little bit more for Deborah, I think. Um, I'm going to warn you by saying that I study public opinion and work with Miguel Cruz for a really long time at Vanderbilt, so it's very public opinion. So you can let me know that I cited Yeah, I will. I'll be very proud, I'm sure. Um, so I'm wondering about insecurity and this distinction between um, perceptions of insecurity and then the objective reality of insecurity. Um, so when you look at public opinion data from Latin America, um, there are two kind of sets of cases that, that jump out at me. So one, you have like Argentina, where there are really high perceptions of insecurity, but from an objective standpoint, it's not a particularly um, unsafe country, which I think is driven by kind of the politicization of insecurity and polarization in the media and society. Um, and then you have Guatemala and Honduras, where um, with the American Barometer, we did this impact study of these USAID programs. And what we actually started to notice was that um, perceptions increased initially with the rise of objective violence and um, victimization and violence. Uh, but then they sort of started to taper off. And what we noticed in a lot of these interviews was that people were doing things on a daily basis to kind of avoid those threats. So they weren't going out at night. They, that kind of changed their, their lifestyles. Um, but they were reporting less insecurity than they had years before when, from an objective, objective standpoint, things weren't as bad as they weren't as violent. Um, so I'm sort of wondering about this perceptions versus reality and whether or not citizenship is kind of in the eye of the beholder or whether there's something about like the objective kind of um, uh, circumstances that these people have to, have to survive. Um, and, and deal with that's more important. 
Um, I can start with some. You know, that's a so um, the other colleague that I work with, think through the Central American case with is Victoria Sanford. And so I first started thinking about sort of kind of post war geography and violence and going to some of her talks, you know, several years ago now, where she um, really maps out very similarly to what you're doing, the kind of the the, the shifts in violence for Guatemala. And so it was linked to her work on femicidio, mm -hmm. actually, and sort of looking at the ways in which um, where folks were recruited from, right, so in the highlands, actually, the violence is lower, right, um, where the genocides took place, but actually, it's where folks were recruited from in the military, in the lowlands, actually, where you have um, the increased violence. That was one of the things that she was sort of thinking through, and really talking about sort of the context of the community in Guatemala. Um, and so her work has really looked at, you know, kind of the continuities of, from genocide to um, femicide um, and disruptions and things like that. So that was one of the first times that I really started to think about um, the, the shifting geographies of violence. And, and in El Salvador, I think, you know, so the folks that I cite in, a, in my longer paper do this comparative study in El Salvador, um, comparing people's perceptions, but also, you know, places where um, violence is actually kind of the same, kind of numerically, right? But so, um, kind of idea, that the, 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 the neoliberal idea that really, I think, crushed El Salvador in the places that I worked was that tension between years of collectivity, years of an idea of collectivity and social justice jutting up against kind of a market-oriented individualist um, way forward in development schemes. Um, and so in, in Chanakya, where I worked in the, in the places that were former repopulated communities, but that had been insurgents, but then had gone to refugee camps in Honduras, and then returned while the war was still going on, it's in those communities. And so you can actually, an amazing newspaper is actually El Faro, which is an online um, periodic newspaper. And so they have this whole reporting on violence in El, in El Salvador called La Sala Negra. So they have an amazing document. It's a, kind of an incredible resource for anyone who um, speaks Spanish and wants to think about Central American cases. But so when I was speaking to Carlos Dada, who was like the, um, the person who funded it five last year, I was speaking to him, he funded it, he started it a while ago, we were talking about this particular question. And so then, um, because all of the reporting is actually in none of those places in Chavate, in the repopulated communities. And so I, I go back to the personal, what research is now showing is that you can now talk about the, the ways in which the political military organizations were actually really, run, ran really deep, ran deeper than what you could say in the early 1990s. And so research is showing that those FMLN, personal networks are still very powerful in a lot of places. And so there is something in the place that I work in that's way with us and in those communities um, that are actually not part of the drug group. They're not like Chalatenango, so like if you actually divide Chalatenango, so it's on you know the El Caminito, the drug pathway is actually a very hot, like by Nueva Concepcion, that area actually has a high, and that's actually where I was instructed in my research years ago before I moved to the other side of Chirate. It's like the road split and you could go left. Right. Um, really, it was like the two bus streets, right? You know. um, that it's in fact in those places that were not highly organized, to not have these deep political military organizations where you have um, organized crime and increased violence. And it's in the repopulated communities where I think those long, despite massive migration um, of the protagonist generation and their kids, where you have, um, you know, los muchachos hondureños come in and they almost, you know, kill Marvin, yet there are always, there's always movements to boot those elements out. Not by the mayor, not by the PNC, but actually by kind of local, um, Local long-term relationships, right? And so I think people are still thinking through through that through those differences. Um, but I do think that that is actually I do think the legacy of that organization.
And I, again, I think these are the kinds of stories that were unable, people were not willing to talk about, even uh, five years into the post-war, is how deep those structures went.